think it's a good start. All right. Wonderful. Everyone is already uh, being a bit more quiet. You have to bear with me for this because we don't have a second microphone. Um, but luckily, our speaker tonight, Hugo Will. Uh, my name is Sebastian. Uh, and together with Timothy, uh, we are the co chairs of the Physics Society. Um, and we are very welcome to our very first talk, the Magnetic Uh Traditionally, uh, for I don't know how many years, we've given this talk together uh, with the Archimedes. Uh, yeah, I'll we'll introduce himself later uh, in the Society uh, for Mathematicians in Cambridge. Um, as Cups, uh, Cambridge University Physics Society. Um, I'll, I'll be quick uh, because we've got much more important things to go into. Um, we host talks on a weekly basis on Wednesdays, normally the day's inception, uh, and we also do social talks, um, mostly physics based. Sometimes there's some more mathematical bits, more applied bits. Um, we were very uh, looking forward to seeing more of you in future talks. You can sign up uh, as well at the entrance of the talk. Um, for now, I'll give the words to you now, and then Keith, our speaker's officer, will introduce our speaker for tonight. I promised him I wouldn't say an embarrassing fact. Uh, sorry, I'm going to run Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my, my name is Yair. I am the president of the Cambridge. Uh, our, main, uh, our main event are uh, this little on a Friday at 6 p.m. in the CMS. And we also do a few uh, pizza and board each night uh, for the term. And you will uh, have to expect a big event for the term, which uh, we feel about uh, if you go, if you go at, uh, at the outside, if you want to sign up for the main event, or because of the last time. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So, we are very honored to have Professor Hugo de Vinier as our speaker for the Macro Hall. And his work focuses on the Macro and the Macro Brass of physical physics, in particular, the sudden phase transition. For example, the transition from gas phase to liquid phase, and he uses some of the theory to analyze the physical models. Uh, and this is quite a huge variety of physical phenomena, such as magnetization of polymers. And by using these connections between these nodes and developing a theory of so called dependent percolation. Um, like Coke. So, Professor Dunyan has obtained a lot of results on this particle model. Well, thank you very much. Welcome. So I was told that I should to lose you in the first seven minutes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, okay. <laughs> I was told I have three hours, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'd like to see the places and also people cannot sleep easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was not told that it was, I was told that you don't get the email carefully, that it was jointly in math and physics, which is very good which because Mathematicians, so I'm happy that there are a few people that will understand me in this room. And <laughs> but I am also, also I, mean, I am in the branch of mathematical physics, so I'm proving mathematically things that 
apart from physical meaning. So I hope that it will be also interesting for the physicists in the, in the room. And in particular, I want basically in the talk to be through one example. That's okay later. That's okay now later. Yeah, yes. through one example, I would like to give an introduction to a few concepts in mathematical physics and in physics in general. Okay, okay. so it's going to be, we are going to follow the line of the history of one model. Of this model. I will tell you what it is. And through this example, you will see a few concepts. Some of them are mentioned here, of course, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one. One of them, some of them I will leave to mention. mention. But, but try to give you, you know, small idea of what is happening. And some, some of these concepts for the people that are not in first year, you will, will have, have maybe encountered in all the contexts already. And I want just to have this illustration. And, and uh, uh, try to bounce both so, on the math side and the physics side of of, of, of. Okay. Okay. okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do first is explain to you how you cook up a mathematical model when you are trying to study a physical phenomenon. Because in, in some, some sense, sense that, that is a connection, connection between, between the mathematicians, the mathematicians and the physicists in the room. When you do mathematical, mathematical physics, physics, you study, study a mathematical characteristic of, of a physical phenomenon. So how, so how do you do, do it? it let me give you one example. So, so this example, example again is a model, model and it's going to be the first. So first, when you want to cook up the model, you first, want when you want to cook up the model, you want a motivation for physics. And my motivation is going to be the following experiment. You have to quickly see that I am, I am a mathematician, right? So the level, the level of the experiments are going to be really lame. This is really, really lame. So this, so for instance, instance, is an experiment, experiment I, can I can do. do. Not, not with the burning myself 10 times, but this is the time where I'm not burning myself. So what is it you put? A magnet, a magnet and, and you hit it. Simply you hit it and, and you wait, wait to see what happens. happens. And, and what, what is going to happen is that, that when you hit a magnet at a certain temperature, when you hit a magnet at a certain temperature this yeah, magnet stopped to be, magnetized. To be a magnet. It it's something that was discovered by it's something that was discovered by actually well discovered is maybe a poor choice of course it was rediscovered and put story by Pierre Curie uh, the husband of Marie Curie uh, and you see what happened here I hit the, the, the magnet at some temperature the magnet at some temperature so weak as a magnet as, 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 as a magnet just gravitate the magnet back to the ground you should always yeah. mention gravitation you should always yeah. mention gravitation so that otherwise you are not <laughs> And uh, okay, not so it was discovered uh, okay, so by Pierre Curie. It was discovered by Pierre Curie. And one of the important discoveries uh, of Pierre Curie magnet, is that whatever the whatever its composition, whatever its composition this always happens. Sometimes, Sometimes so for iron, iron, it's, it's around, around 770 degrees. degrees. So yeah. you guess that this is not, not the magnet I use. I didn't use a magnet made of iron. And, and that's why you know part of me would like to be a physicist to be able to use this huge you know, uh, magnet. <laughs> A lighter a light. or something like that. But for so iron, if you hit sufficiently, sufficiently you, you get demagnetized at 770 degrees. degrees. And, and here, here it's, it's kind, kind of, of a mixture of, of, I don't remember of what it's made, but then the, the critical temperature is around 200 degrees. So actually, you, you reach it through, uh, uh, through a light. So, question, question can we understand mathematically, and actually physically, why, why is this happening? Why so a magnet when hit it? So as a mathematician, the first thing you are going to do is you are going to try to define your object properly. So what do I mean by a mathematical magnet? So let's start. So, so magnets, magnets known for a long time. I mean, you can think of it as a huge collection, collection of many, many, many small dipoles. dipoles. It's, it's some, some small element, element that have, have a magnetic moment. You can, can think, think of it as a collection, collection of small, small magnets. magnets. Okay. Tiny magnets. So let's call them sigma x. Okay, okay. Uh, sigma x, x is going to be the orientation of your magnet, and x is a position of this small type. And what we and have to do, have to do is something classical in, in, in mathematics and in physics is that we, we follow. Uh, um, the motto of, of a very famous, famous mathematical, mathematical physicist, Mark Hess, who says that you should be wise and you should discretize. So, so let's discretize. Several advantages. You don't, you don't have, have to do, do it. it. 
but it, it becomes with a lot, lot of, of benefits. So first, so first thing, for instance, instance, you are going to imagine that at your small dipoles, they are regular. regularly spaced. Okay. okay. This is very useful for people who already did a little bit of physics or math. For people who already did a little bit of physics or math, if you have uh, uh, a group acting on, on the basis, you can use Fourier analysis, for instance. You can use a lot of tools that, that are not true if, if you don't assume something regular. So you so regularly space your dipoles, dipoles on a portion of the lattice. Here, let's say Z. Lattice. Here, let's say Z. So, so on, on two dimensions, the square lattice is for people who, like, like me, who picture, picture things in 2D. The, the second discretization we are going to make is that these small dipoles, a priori, they act like a priori, they, 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 they point a bit in any direction. But I'm going to assume that actually that there, is there is only two directions that the dipole can, can, can take. It's either pointing say north or south, or plus one, minus one, or mathematician. So, so that's, so that's the two assumptions. Regular space, regular space and only, and two, only direction, two direction, what we would call totally, totally anisotropic, anisotropic uh, dipoles. They dipoles only they point. Only point yeah, I mean, they, they, they don't have the natural isotropy that you could guess from, from a magnet. And after these two uh, assumptions, you, you end up with what I will call a magnet in the mathematical sense. It's just a collection of dipoles pointing north or south on a part of a lattice or plus one, minus one on a part of a lattice. So it's just a function from the vertices of your lattice into plus or minus one, okay? So once I have a magnet, I want to be measuring something out of this magnet. And maybe the thing that you would like to be understanding is the total magnetization, the strength, if you want, of your magnet. And a way of measuring the strength in a fairly reasonable way is to just average the dipoles, average the orientation of the dipoles. So you say one over volume, so one over the number of dipoles, sum of sigma x. So if this magnetization is say plus one, that means that all the sigma x are plus one, it's gonna be a magnet that is strongly pointing north. If it's minus one, it's strongly pointing south. And if roughly half of the dipoles are pointing up, half are pointing down, then you get a mean uh, magnetization, which is roughly zero, and you are typically looking at a material which is actually not attracted to north or south, which doesn't have any magnetization. Okay. So that's the first kind of uh, part of the story. You start from your experiments and you try to cook up a mathematical object that is going to be describing well, the subject of your experiment, which in this case is, is a magnet. Okay. That's you know, you, you all heard about several kinds of physics, right? We have physics of the infinitely large. So if you think of it, this is um, Einstein general relativity, right? He describes the universe like that. You have the physics, the infinitely small, the quantum physics. Here we are talking about the physics of our scale in some sense, right? We are talking when we think statistical physics, we think maybe describing the air of in this room, okay? And the kind of important item that you need to remember when you talk about this type of physics is that it's the physics of complex systems, meaning systems that have many, many components. When you look at quantum physics, sometimes you are going to just look at the interaction between a few photons, for instance, right? We have, I mean, the Nobel Prize in Physics this, uh, this year was actually talking about uh, like the the superposition and, uh, and um, the non-locality of quantum physics by exactly studying two, uh, two photons that are entangled. Um, here, and, and if you think macroscopic, like I mean, we usually look at a few planets trying to interact with, uh, with, with uh, a star. Here, we are really talking of something completely different. Your magnet is made of millions of mi and billions of billions of billions of billions of small dipoles. So very complex system. If it's a very complex system, you need something, some, some kind of tool to, to study it. And the tool is going to be to use randomness. You don't want to be looking at the actual behavior of your magnet, like knowing each dipole in which direction it's pointing. This is way too complicated. You are going to look at the typical behavior. So let's introduce randomness. So typically, the randomness, you don't want to introduce it in a completely stupid way. So let me tell you how you do it in this case. 
So before speaking of of, of the, the probability measure that is sampling your 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 random now magnets, you need to talk about something more elementary, which is the energy of the magnet. So what you want to be saying when you look at the magnet is that two neighboring dipoles, exactly like two small magnets, they want to align. Okay. If they want to align, that means that if they are aligned, they have a certain joint energy. If they are disaligned, they have a larger energy. And a way of measuring that is to say for every neighbor in your, uh, uh, your lattice, uh, you have an energy which is minus sigma x, sigma y. Why? Because sigma x and sigma y, if they are equal, you get energy minus one. If they are not equal, you get energy plus one. So a higher energy if you are not agreed. And now you say, okay, the total energy of my magnet is just the sum of this energy. So you are basically counting the number of disagreements for neighboring uh, vertices. By the way, this, I mean, why would you interact only with your neighbors and not say the next to neighbor well here it's let me just finish and then i, I answer uh, your question oh oh that's what uh, you wanted to answer my question oh that, that was a rhetorical one <laughs> no so 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 why you want that simply as a simplifying feature but actually you can do things if you low interaction which maybe is weaker and weaker with versus i mean pairs of, of things that are farther and farther away so here is just for this talk, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about what we call the nearest neighbor model, the model where only neighbors interact, but this is actually something you can relax. It's not a big addition. Okay, so you have this total energy, and now you do something classical in physics, it's Boltzmann, which is, I mean, who is maybe the, one of the fathers, founding fathers of, of statistical physics. <laughs> What you do is that you define a probability measure, you sample uh, an object proportionally to exponential of minus the energy. So the higher the energy, the smaller the probability, which makes sense. I mean, if it's hard, if you have a high energy object, it should be less likely to happen in, in, in nature. Except that there is some kind of parameter that is telling you how much you care about the energy. And this parameter, we call it one over T, and you should think of T as the temperature. In fact, the temperature is just a measurement of the disorder, the, the level of excitation in your system. So if T is extremely large, if you have very high temperature, you should think the system is completely disordered. And in some sense, dipoles almost forget that they need to interact with their neighbors. And this is exactly what you see in this case. If you take T very, very large, what is going to happen is that one over T times the energy is basically zero, right? So you are basically taking a uniform choice of orientation. On the other hand, if T is very small, it's getting to, to the absolute zero, then in some sense, the spin that the dipoles want really to align. They, they are like good soldiers. They want to align with their neighbors. And then here, what you see is that one over T is going to become very large, and only the configuration with the smallest energy are going to survive. And what are these two configurations? It's all plus or all minus. Okay. <coughs> so T again, if there is one thing you can keep of this uh, uh, of this talk is the temperature is a level of disorder of excitation in your system. Okay, and that's the easing model. So you see, you survive seven minutes. I, I hope at least, or, or you fake it very well because you still look at me, so that's good. Or oh, you look there. But, um, and now, once you have the easing model, exactly like before, you need to measure something on your system. So here, what you are going to measure is not the magnetization of a given magnet, but the average magnetization. Now that you have an average, uh, a random object, you are going to average it to see in some sense what is the, the mean the typical magnetization of your uh, of your magnet and here well if you think about it you don't end up with something so interesting because the mean magnetization is actually zero whatever the temperature why because if you think about it the magnet 
and it's exact opposite where you reverse all the spins, they have exactly the same energy, right? Because they have the same probability, but they contribute exactly minus what the other one contributes. So if you look at the average, you get exactly this. So this is a little bit of a disappointment for now, because if you think like that, it looks like all magnets in your mathematical life, uh, mathematical world, have zero magnetization. Not that interesting. That's because we didn't get to the third step of, uh, is it the third? Because I'm, as a mathematician, I'm, I'm bound to compute carefully this up to three. Uh, so I think that's the third step. So you need, in fact, to break a fourth step, maybe. You need to break the symmetry. And here, it's going to be like that. What you are going to do is that you are going to fall. So you have your magnet. Imagine that it's actually the box of size. I mean, the vertices, the spins are on the box of the certain size, 100 by 100 or 1 billion by 1 billion. And what you are going to do, you are going to force the boundary spins, the boundary dipoles to be pointing north, to be pointing plus one. OK? I love because I put this video that has nothing to do with what I'm saying, but everybody is kind of like, oh, there is a red dot moving. <laughs> because we are laughing at cats, but we are exactly the same, right? <laughs> okay, okay. So anyway, here the only important thing is plus spin, you force the boundary to be plus spin. Imagine a little bit like you are immersing your magnet into a magnetic field that is forcing the boundaries to be pointing up, so to be aligned with the magnetic. In fact, by the way, I mean, don't put, uh, I mean, uh, don't really blame me for that, but this is a slight simplification. Actually, there is a much better way to make sense of uh, an external magnetic field, but for this talk, it's going to be sufficient. So you imagine that your magnet now is in a magnetic field, there's the Earth's magnetic field. And you exactly define the same measure. You measure the energy and you, uh, define the probability measure that is favoring configuration with small energy, okay? But notice that now I will call it mu plus, just to kind of remind you that you are pointing up on the boundary. And here now, notice that I cannot reverse the spins anymore. I mean, I can reverse all the spins, but the boundary spin, but that changes the energy because now on the boundary, the spins, when I reverse them, they interact with the boundary in a different fashion. So at least I broke the symmetry between pluses and minuses, which <laughs> looks like, okay, I mean, of course, if I take a magnet at absolutely no magnetic field, they will, it will never choose one of its favorite directions. If I put it in a magnetic field, then it will choose the direction. Okay. So now, when I look at the mean uh, magnetization, it's strictly positive. But, it's not that important that it's strictly positive for a box of size 100 by 100. What is important is that, I mean, as I said, we are looking at a very complex system. There are many, many spins in, uh, I mean, dipoles in the magnet. So as a mathematician, when you want to understand this, you don't panic. What you say is, okay, I'm going to call my best friend, infinity, and I'm going to just, Take, instead of thinking of a large system, I'm exactly going to take a new pin system. And it's going to approximate extremely well the physical system that you find. So here, what you do is that now that you, I was looking at the finite object, which I want to be defining the energy, right? There was a number of disagreements. If I take an infinite system, there will be an infinite number of plus one and minus one. This, this is not good for a mathematician. So you, we were actually working in finite systems. Lambda was fine. But now I take lambda to infinity. Take bigger and bigger boxes, I go to infinity. And there is a natural question that happens. So this M plus of physics magnetization, when I take the limit when lambda tends to infinity, it converges to something. I mean, you have to prove that, but it converges, gets closer and closer to something. This thing, I call it M star of T, and uh, actually la, pa la parole est à cubes. Okay. That's uh, welcome, Coops. Um, okay, so it's called, it's written M star of T. You cannot see it. And we call this the spontaneous magnetization. And if you think about it, this is really what you should think of as 
the magnetization of your system. So it's like the limit at infinity of the magnetization of this final. Well, that's going to be the key player in system. Okay. From now on, we are going to talk about this M star of T, this spontaneous magnetization. So that was for the cooking up of the system of the of the mathematical model. Oh, and what I want you to remember is that you should be taking the interval. Okay, so first recap. There is a first recap. Oh, that's too pedagogical. <laughs> okay, so first recap, physical phenomena, they lead to mathematical models, but you need to do some uh, simplifying features. You do a mathematical caricature, basically. Of course. And this, yeah, actually, I'm going to go fast on this slide. This is more for more advanced, maybe, uh, people, but it's a general fact. It's something that comes up quite often in mathematical physics. So, for instance, you may try to be understanding what we call uh, interface growth. So, how uh, an interface is growing in time. And there are mathematical models which uh, make what we call the KPZ uh, equation appear. You may try to understand the kinetic theory of gas. So you want to understand air in the room. There are mathematical models for that as well, where you, again, you, you, you assume like simplifying features. You can try to understand the nuclei of heavy atoms and you can model it by what we call random matrices. So I don't know if everybody saw matrices in their life, but you can pick them at random and look in fact at what we call the, the spectral properties of this. And these are going to be mathematical models for real life phenomena. Okay. Just to say, I mean, for instance, I mean, I'm going to tell you about things that we know how to do. Let me tell you about something we don't know how to do as mathematical physicists. And I guess you can stop listening to me after that, thinking that I'm not really a serious person. Is that we don't know why water is boiling, which is a little bit embarrassing. So there are natural models for water. And you would like to be understanding that there is a phase transition between liquid water and boiling water and, and vapor, but we don't actually know how to, to handle this mathematical model. So even if these are caricatures of the real uh, life, that doesn't mean they are very easy to, uh, to understand. But one thing which you want to be aiming at when you construct a mathematical model is that you actually not only want it to be a nice caricature for the physical phenomena, but you also want it to be an interesting object mathematically. I mean, to be honest, if I enter this field, it's because I was interested in the mathematics involved in, the, in, in, in these models. Of course, I was very happy to be able to use a little bit of my physical intuition. But again, these models, maybe it's just a gift of nature that they both describe physical objects, but they also are very, very rich mathematics. Okay, so you can have mathematical friends and physical friends. Usually, it's fine. You, you you are motivated by the same. Okay, so let's go to the second part of the. Talk. So phase transition, because what I said in the case of of uh, of Curie experiment is that there is in fact a phase transition between a, a, just a regime where. Um, there is a magnet in a regime where you are not magnetized anymore. So another way of putting it is that if I look at the temperature and I look at this spontaneous magnetization, above a certain point, this spontaneous magnetization is zero, which means I'm not a magnet. I don't have any preference for north or south. And below, so I'm, we are calling this regime a paramagnet. And below uh, this critical temperature, this TC, you are a ferromagnet, you have this spontaneous magnetization, which is strictly positive. That's what you see in real life. When you do your experiment, it's exactly the reason why you get a magnet and then it ceases to be a magnet at a certain temperature. So the question is, for the Ising model, can you actually understand this? Can you see exactly the same thing? And because I will mention this several times, this is called the critical temperature, and you will see critical phenomena a lot in your, uh, I mean, at least for the physicists, you will see this a lot in your studies. Okay, so that's actually a good time to tell you a little bit about the history of the Ising model. 
So it started pooling. Let's put it like that. So when you cook up a model, you want to check whether it's a good model. Okay. So Lenz, who was Easing's PhD advisor, proposed a model to Easing. And what Easing did, so Ernst Easing was a German physicist. You see, he was doing that in 1925 and he was doing his PhD. So it didn't look like that during his PhD. I mean, hopefully. No, I think this is a picture from later on. I'm certain of it. Um, so what he did is that he looked at the magnets where the, the dipoles are actually spaced on the line. Okay. And what you notice here is something quite puzzling is that the critical temperature is zero. What does it mean? It means as soon as you tune the temperature, you always get zero spontaneous magnetization. In other words, you don't have magnets. You are always in the paramagnetic phase. What, what Ising actually put in this kind of nice way, <laughs> optimistic way, let's say. So I discussed the result of my paper widely with Professor Lenz and with Dr. Wolfgang Pauli, the Pauli from quantum physics, who at that time was teaching in Hamburg. There was some disappointment that the linear model did not show the expected ferromagnetic property. There is no magnet, it's disappointing. I think the some disappointment is an understatement. I think they were really, really very, very unhappy about that. And they were so unhappy about that that Ernst Ising unfortunately left academia after that and learned only like 30 years later that the model was named after him because at the end, right? I mean, Lenz introduced the model, but it's named after Ising. Um, and I mean, Ising is one of the most common first name you will hear in, in physics, basically. That's a, that's a very, very common name. By the way, it's named after Ising, despite the fact that what Ising did is this, which is actually an easy exercise. And he also predicted that this would be the same whatever the dimension. I will come back to that in, 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 in one minute. Okay, that was already about sign. So there is, it doesn't seem to be that there is a I mean, a, a magnetic phase for the Ising model, so it's a catastrophic model for ferromagnetic phase. And actually, it didn't stop there. You know, I mean, when somebody is thinking, you, I mean, it could not be that. Kind of <laughs> in this case, Heisenberg did that to push the, the person even lower, uh, because Heisenberg, from quantum physics again, discovered in, I mean, introduced in 19. 28 may no, it didn't look like that also at the time, I guess, but uh, he introduced another model uh, where he basically replaced these small dipoles instead of thinking of them as small dielectric uh, moments. He actually replaced them by what we call a spin angular momentum of the electrons that you have in atoms. And he used quantum physics to cook up a model for magnetism. And this is actually a much, much, much better model for ferromagnetism. In fact, at, I mean, the 20s is one of the golden age of quantum physics. And the fact that the Ising model didn't introduce at all, I mean, didn't connect to quantum physics was actually a catastrophic news because at the time it was clear that ferromagnetism had to be connected to quantum physics. So not only the model didn't look like it was showing up, uh, I mean, showing, uh, exhibiting, uh, um, a magnetic uh, ferromagnetic phase, but also anyway, it was not based on the right, in some sense, physical reason. So at this point, you can wonder why on Earth people still work on the easing model. Well, there were a few pros, and the first one is that despite what easing predicted, that you would never see a ferromagnetic phase. In fact, you always see a ferromagnetic phase if you are not in dimension one. So it's the wrongest prediction you can make. So that's a good way to try to get uh, uh, your name in history, apparently. And also it's a message of hope for the people who want to do uh, a doctorate. <laughs> but I'm not saying you should predict something wrong. Uh, don't, don't hit me on that. But so rid of first exactly proves the opposite. So there is actually whatever the dimension, which is not one, you will find a ferromagnetic phase. And in particular, the most important thing is dimension three, right? At the end, magnets are three dimensional. So there is a ferromagnetic. And the second thing that Pearl did, which is probably even more important, is that he noticed that P 
people were trying mathematical caricatures, like mathematical models for all the phenomena, in, part, in particular bin binary alloys. So if you mix two types of atoms. And the models they were using there, actually they were just a restatement of the easing model. They were completely equivalent. So what does it mean? Well, it means something very deep that one model, even though it's not a perfect model for something, it can be actually a moderately good model for many things many different phenomena and that's one of the power of mathematical models is to be modeled for different objects because then different phenomena because it creates a bridge if you want between a dictionary between what happens in these different uh, phenomena so after that people liked the easing model much more but maybe it was not that clear it was one of the coolest models you could think of and it became much more clear after somebody entered into the game and because we are in the chemistry building, right? I had to speak about the chemistry uh, Nobel Prize winner. So Lars Anzager, who is a Nobel Prize in chemistry, uh, proved in 1944 the following thing. So he took Z2, so he looked at two-dimensional magnets, sorry, this is just to scare you. You don't have to panic. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. So from now on, this is a simple formula that you would get. Everything else is worse. <laughs> I, right? I did the part of the work. Now you have to do yours. No, don't worry. It's just to give you a, an example of what uh, formula can look like. So what this formula is saying is not important. I mean, what it's saying is very important. How it looks is not important. Um, what it's saying is that it's looking at the quantity we call the free energy, which is in some sense the mean, the typical energy per unit of, of volume. If you want, it's a typical energy of your magnet. Okay. Of course, if you take a twice bigger magnet, it will have a twice bigger energy. So it's just renormalized by the size of the magnet. So the free energy. And what he did is that he computed this quantity explicitly. He gave a formula. And that was an absolute revolution because for people who know a little bit about statistical physics up to now, basically people only knew how to do things in one dimension or in what we call the mean field regime, which is not a very reasonable regime for actual physical phenomena. And that was the first time where somebody said, okay, wait guys and girls, um, you can actually compute explicitly things and study a model which is not meaningful or one dimensional. And this completely changed the face of mathematical physics. This is one of the biggest achievements of, of modern mathematical physics. So the four, I mean, you know, you laugh, it looks, it looks like a bad formula. Uh, it is a bad formula, but it's even worse if you have to read the actual paper so you see you should at least feel happy that you don't have to read the paper and understand the proof uh, actually it was simplified a little bit later by Bruria Kaufman and now in fact there are like many different ways of proving this formula so it looks bad but there are many ways of uh, proving this using very different fields of mathematics and just for your culture there is this cool article from Baxter and Enting in 1978 which is called the 399th solution of the Ising model, meaning the 399th proof of this. Okay, it's a slight exaggeration, but there are like really many, many different proofs. It has been a very inspiring area of mathematical physics that led to many interesting developments. And at this stage, you think, okay, please make it that the next slide is not as complicated. Uh, but let me mention just to go back maybe to the key player I mentioned, which was the spontaneous magnetization, right? So let's go back to it because why are you talking about the free energy? So there was a young physicist, Chen Ning Yang, who in 1952 actually computed the, the spontaneous magnetization itself, which is what you are interested in at the end. And he had this formula, one minus hyperbolic sine of two over T, to the power one over eight when it's positive and zero if it's negative. And this formula immediately tells you something, right? It's saying this formula is zero if T is actually larger than two over log one plus square root two, because if you take sine of two over T 
for this TC, you get exactly one. So if T is larger than that, this spontaneous magnetization is zero. If T is smaller than that, it's strictly positive. So what did uh, Young prove? He proved that uh, actually it can be proved in a different way, but this immediately tells you, in fact, not only there is a critical temperature that is separating ferromagnetic phase from paramagnetic phase, but you can compute it explicitly. It is two over log of one plus log. For uh, just for culture, people at the time looked at uh, at Young and said, "Oh, that's I mean, why are you so smart and working on such a stupid uh, question <laughs> to compute this potential magnetization?" Well, I guess uh, Young had some mathematical side in him. So, but Young is actually the Young from Young Mills, from Lee Young, from Young Baxter. I mean, he's one of the most famous theoretical physicist of the 20th century. We all, always hear about, you know, Einstein or the, the, the guy, Heisenberg, or the guys from the early uh, 20s, but Young is like one of the most impressive physicists of the second half of the 20th century, if not the most impressive. So you can, you can start by a stupid question and get somewhere. Um, okay, but one thing which is important here here is that it's on the square lattice and it's linked to a very specific property of the square lattice. I just mentioned it for your culture, which is called integrability. You always need to leave a little bit of mystery in the talk, so I will not tell you what integrability means. But what I want you to remember is square lattice. Yeah? Square lattice. Okay, that's the end of the second part. That, there was a half. Yeah, that was fine, right? You can just forget what I said for a minute and then touch. Okay, so what's the next level? So we know now there is a phase transition. What's the next level? Well, the next level is to try to understand if this phase transition is continuous or discontinuous. So what's a continuous phase transition? Let's do it as a mathematician. You explain something by giving a counter example. So counter example, uh, what is not continuous is if you put water in your freezer and you, uh, that's a very good freezer, let's say, and you let it pass zero degrees, water freeze, and one thing can happen if you are not careful is that this is gonna make your bottle explode. Why? Because at zero degrees, there's a change of density in water. Ice is like 10% roughly higher than water in terms of volume per, per amount of, of, uh, of uh, of H2. So this is a discontinuous phase transition because if I draw the volume as a function of the temperature, there is a jump at zero degrees. So it's a phase transition between solid and liquid, and it's a discontinuous one because the parameter has to change discontinuously. Well, it's not what you see when you do, um, when you look at Curie's experiment. If you measure the strength of your magnets, the magnetization, it decays continuously, reaches zero at the critical temperature, and then stays equal to zero up to, uh, uh, I mean, for higher temperatures. So this is a continuous phase transition. There's still a phase transition between ferromagnets and paramagnet, but when I measure the order parameter, when I measure the parameter in my system, it goes continuously to zero and then stays at zero. And if you tune the two-dimensional formula this, uh, of, of Young, what you see is you see something continuous. It actually decays continuously to zero and then stays to zero. So question, can you do that for three-dimensional magnets, for three-dimensional easing mode? Keeping in mind that we have, we think of, of, uh, of still trying to model ferromagnetism. Okay. Well, what happens, and this is the theorem uh, that maybe I want you, I mean, if I wanted to mention one theorem uh, tonight, this is this one, is that you can actually prove that the phase transition is continuous in dimension three. So what do I mean by that? So imagine, so in two dimension, we had an exact formula. We have a, just an expression for the function. So you just check that it's a continuous function. In 3D, you don't have an exact formula for the function. We don't know that the model can have actually an exact formula. You know, there are functions that you cannot 
expressed in terms of your favorite uh, functions. So we don't have a formula, but worse than that, we don't even know what the critical temperature is. And we don't believe there is a nice formula for it either. It's a number between zero and infinity, and probably its best description is that this is a critical temperature of the three-dimensional reading of it. Okay, it's not, it's not rational, not algebraic, probably nothing special about this number. Still, so you don't know the, the function, you don't know the value at which you want to be studying the function, but still you can prove that if I look at the magnetization and I look at it exactly at the critical point, it's going to be zero. And in fact, once you have that, it's very easy to deduce that the function is actually continuous. This is a difficult part. So that's a result that we got with Michael Eisenman and Vlad Sidoravicius. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about the proof. Don't worry, there will be no formula, or almost none. And of course, if a mathematician tells you, don't worry, you should worry. That's uh, one of the first reflex. But <laughs> anyway, you are stuck here. So not really, but um, you are stuck here. Because if you leave, I know uh, your face now. So. <laughs> so in order to tell you a little bit about the proof, I need to introduce a new, I mean, a new bunch of players. In order to, I mean, instead of looking at the spontaneous magnetization, at this measurement of, of the magnetization of the system, I'm going to look at how much dipoles have a tendency to align in my magnet. Because in fact, if you have spontaneous magnetization, that means that's kind of equivalent to the fact that the dipoles want to align to each other. If I tell you this one is pointing up. In fact, it, there is a much bigger probability that this one very far is still pointing up rather than down. So in fact, they, remember there is a large distance memory of the spins of each other. So let's introduce spin-spin correlations. Well, bad formula, but you don't have to understand it. It's just the average of sigma zero, sigma x. So you think a spin at zero, a spin at x, and you look at the tendency that they have to align. So you look at the average. If the average is zero, that means that whatever I tell you on this one, this one has a tendency to just be well, plus one or minus one, not caring at all about this one. If on the contrary, this quantity is positive and very positive, it means that if I tell you the, uh, the direction of this one, well, this one has a rather tendency to be aligned with it rather than disaligned, because we want sigma zero, sigma x to be rather plus one than minus one. So it, the formula is what it is. You can forget it. It's not that important. And again, as usual, you take infinite volume limits, you go to an infinite. Okay. There are way too many things on this slide. So don't, don't follow my lead. <laughs> of, uh, if you are asked to, to give a talk, you should put much less things on it. Okay? It's, it's one of the benefits of the edge that you can stop doing really bad talks and nobody can blame you anymore. <laughs> okay. so. Keeping up with the uh, that talk, and um, so one first thing that you can try to look at is that if you look at the correlation between two spins and you let them, you let one of them go to infinity, you put it further and further away. You can think, you know, it's maybe kind of natural to expect that it's going to feel less and less the impact of the first thing, just you know, forgetting a little bit about. It. So these two spins, they become what we call independent, more and more independent. And if they are independent, they act like one spin. And actually one spin, when you look at its average, and this is one of the reasons why we introduce this quantity, it's exactly the spontaneous magnetization. The spontaneous magnetization was kind of an average in space, but it's exactly the same as averaging one guy against the merge. So, if you look at two spins, you look at the spin-spin correlation, you let one of them go to infinity, it's gonna to converge to probability of this being, I mean, uh, average of this times average of this, and each one is the magnetization, so you get magnetization squared. Okay. That was the easy part. So how the part, which I will definitely not tell you about, is that in fact, you can prove that at the critical point, this spin-spin correlation, they go to zero. So you will tell me, well, this proof is really not that bad at the end, because if I get m star of t squared in the first thing and zero in the second, that means that m star of tc is zero, right? I mean, 
m star of tc squared is equal to zero. So what's the catch? The catch is that we do mathematics. Oh, I should not follow my, I mean, finish my joke, I think. Not in this video. Okay, so we do mathematics, so every symbol matters. And I was very careful about putting a plus for the measure at the top and nothing at the bottom. And in fact, it's very, you remember the measure with nothing is the measure that is symmetric on the plus or minus. And the measure on the top was one where we force the boundary string to be plus. So it's not at all the same measures a priori. If I can prove they are the same, then I win. But that's exactly the core of the thing. Okay. So I think we all lost a few neurons, I mean, you more than me on this one. <laughs> I lost them a long time ago. Um, so let me do what, uh, what we call in French a trou normand. So if you don't know what a trou normand is, that means you don't have enough French friends. Uh, <laughs> a trou normand is a way to eat much more than you should. So what you do is that in the middle of your uh, dinner, you start drinking this very strong alcohol and it's just gonna you know, burn everything in, uh, in your stomach and you can get the second meal for free. I mean, not for free, but you have room for the second meal. So uh, the true normal is a way to just make a, a, a detour and, and, and rest a little bit. So let's forget about what I said up to now and let me tell you about something completely different, okay? I'm allowed to do that. So I'm gonna tell you about random graph. So what is it? Imagine it's a random maze. You take you take a graph, let's say a piece of the square lattice, and you are going to allow certain edges in your graph to be what we call open, meaning that you can travel through them. I, I just drew them in red here, and some of them are just closed. You cannot go through them. Okay, and I'm going to take it at random. And for instance, just to give Give you one example what you can do is you can toss a bias coin if it's p you put the edge in red if it's one minus p you remove the edge you, you put it in gray okay so for each edge you choose at random whether you can go through it or not and you end up at the end with a random maze okay so up to now it's maybe not uh, super clear why you want to do that but let's bear with me for for 10 more seconds and let's say now I want to understand where can I go? Mine is still working. So we keep going. So where can you go? <laughs> Was it a sign that we are already over time? <laughs> No problem. So this is the improved version of the true normal where you can really rest like a... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Efficient, I must say. Very good. Okay, so what we are going to study, so let's get back on track. So we have this random maze. And what we want to be studying is where can I go from where? Like, I mean, what are the connectivity properties in this? It's something very important, by the way, in modern graph theory. This, this is actually, you know, mattering when you, I mean, graph theory is appearing when you are searching on the internet. The, the search algorithms are based on graph theory and, and sometimes even on, on, on percolation. So you, we look at connectivity properties and here are two pictures. These are pictures. This is for P equals 0 0.49 something like that, maybe 49.5 even. So meaning that the edges, like the, the, the coin I'm tossing is slightly more head in tail than face. So I put a little bit more gray than red in edges in my graph, okay? And what I end up with is this picture. So what are the colors? They are if you want the rooms in my graph. So they are what we call the connected components. So if you are coloring the same color, say here, that means that I can go from any place to any place in my graph. If I'm in another color, it means it's a different room in my graph, a different place which is disconnected from me. I cannot go there, but between the different points in there, I can go. And what you see is that, and you will agree with that, I guess, is that the rooms are very small. 
right? They are, they, none of them is big. Here, it's P equals 0 0.505, almost the same value for the coin tosses, except it's slightly more pale than head. Head, I don't remember what I did, but whatever. There is a little bit more red than gray. And there, immediately, you see something completely different. There is one huge room, one huge connected component. You can go from everywhere to everywhere in this connected component. That's called a phase transition again. There is a drastic change of behavior by slightly varying the value of. And this is typically what you want to study in percolation theory. So let me just tell you why you want to study percolation theory. For instance, I mean, it's a good model for porosity, porosity of different medium. Right? For instance, you take coal and you look at whether certain gas are going to go through coal or not, and it's going to give you some uh, mask that you can use for, uh, say, uh, painting. So be careful not to mention anything like uh, vehicles here. So for painting, and by the way, just for your culture, so it's a model that was introduced by mathematician in the in the 50s, and but, but there was a very interesting experiment by Rosalind Franklin, she is the same Rosalind Franklin than from DNA, okay? And she was exactly doing that. She was taking coal, putting it at different temperature and seeing which gas goes through coal or not, depending on the size of the molecules in the gas. And this is kind of the first experiment you can think of, of percolation. It's really like looking at the percolating properties of a medium. Of course, of course, the mathematician could be percolation because they like coffee and you know they are obsessed with it. And so like porosity means coffee. But in general, it's a very good model for uh, for porosity. So to conclude, like I'm almost done. Um, that's another advantage when you are old that people don't dare to stop you. So <laughs> um, but let me finish with a take-home message, maybe. What's the connection between this true normal and uh, and the proof before? Is that in fact you can encode the correlation in the easing model using a model of percolation. What do I mean by that? I mean that if I look at this connectivity properties, like the, the spin spin, sorry, if I look at the spin spin correlations, I can rewrite it in a certain percolation model, so a model of random graph as the probability that the two points where the spins are, are connected by a path in my random graph. The, the random graph is catastrophically bad. It's not uh, the model that I just introduced in the previous uh, slide, but there is a model of percolation for which this is. And this is, you know, for people who have very uh, bad uh, intuition like me, it's very good because this correlation in the easing model, this that it looks a little bit abstract. It's not, how you manipulate them. But what I'm saying is that you can translate it into a question of connectivity of drawing, basically, like, is there a path between two points? And, and the kid in me likes this type of drawings. But the good thing with it is that usually when you find the kind of hidden connection between two objects, uh, the connection goes further. So by the way, this connection is not by me. It was found by, by people before me. But um, in particular, you have many more things that come with it. In particular, you can compare the correlation for the plus measure with the correlation for the measure without pluses. And when you do the difference, you, you, you obtain the probability, I'm almost done, that zero and x are connected to infinity. Another property of my percolation. But now notice one thing. If zero and x are connected to infinity, if I think about the picture from last slide, there was this picture of red, right? There was basically one huge connected component. And all the others were tiny, right? In the picture on the right. What does it say? It said that if there is a mean, so this was just a picture in a box, but if I look at the full plane picture, in fact, there would be only one infinite connected component, like the red would go to infinity, but there would be only one. So if zero and X are connected to infinity, what do I get for free? If the same property is true here, I get that they are connected together. They are in the same connected component. But if they are in the same connected component, then zero and X are connected, so I can use the first formula. 
the first formula is telling me if zero and x are connected, this is exactly the probability, I mean, the, the spin spin correlations for the model without tracing. So, what did I get? I get that the correlation for plus are smaller than twice the correlation for the measure without plus. But if on the right this goes to zero and on the left this goes to the spontaneous magnetization squared, like I told you, then I get zero. So you see, it's a kind of a funny thing that maybe you only get when you go beyond the experiment that you make this mathematical model. One is actually for ferromagnetism. The other one is for porosity of media. It has nothing to do with ferromagnetism. But at the level of abstraction of the mathematical model, there is a link between the two. And using this link, like a dictionary, if you want, you can translate a question which is a priori difficult in the easing world into a question which is much simpler to handle in the pair collision world. And of course, it goes both ways. That's, uh, I mean, there is no, not one model which is better than the other one. And that was one of the things I wanted to tell you that, you know, physics, math, in fact, science in general is about making this type of bridges that you don't see at first, but which connect completely different objects and completely different phenomena. And uh, after that, I'm just going to show you a picture. Ah. No, no, I panicked. I panicked. <laughs> Let me, no, I panicked again. It's because I want you to stay and watch me for a little bit longer. That's why. <laughs> okay, let me just finish with the picture because I know that this is the most important thing, at least to me. You don't dare do anything else. Okay, good. Uh, these are just to finish, these are three models of percolation, completely different to the models that uh, I mentioned before, but it was just to give you an idea that this is actually a very rich area of both mathematics and physics. These are models where you want to look at connectivity, but this time it's random balls that are sent in, in the plane. This is a model which is a model of dependent percolation because it was mentioned before. Um, and it's a model which is connected to many, many different physical phenomena, not only ferromagnetism. And there, for instance, it's a model which is related to random waves, what we call it. it's random eigenfunction of Laplacian. It's connected in particular to localization of electrons for people who did a little bit more of physics, for instance, Anderson localization. And, and this is a model which is connected to that. So it seems that percolation has some good years in front of it because it's connected to many different physical phenomena. And uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> and so, that's it. really wonderful. And I think I understood more than seven minutes. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, we actually do still have time, so there's Aha. too much of a rush. Uh, and we can have a few questions from the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, also think we've got this thing. Uh, um, we have got many feelings about new things. Uh, but maybe so everyone can hear. Uh, you, you can catch it. You are asking physicists and mathematicians to catch something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm a yokel, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I can hear you because you are two meters away from me, but I'm not okay. sure that. <laughs> Um, okay, so the question is already pretty advanced. So the question here is, I mean, is about something which goes beyond. So again, when we prove that there is a continuous phase transition, it's yet another step towards something more. And continuous phase transition has this beautiful thing that they have what we call emergent loads, thing that you don't imagine are happening in your system, but when you look at the critical system, these things appear. And then you have a question of what type of things appear. And if the same things appear for different models, you say that they are in the same universality. That's a question here, which is, 
if the even model is the same universality class as percolation model, I mean Bernoulli percolation, so they are not in the same universality class. And even if, uh, what you can do is that you can take the model of percolation, which is directly related to the Ising model, which is not Bernoulli percolation. And there they are in the same universality class in the sense that they share. If you want the connection goes beyond just being able to put possibility of the first position. You can do much more with it. And in particular, you can study this with emergent clones. Easier questions? <laughs> you throw it to somebody at random and... Uh, anyone else any questions? Uh, <laughs> what is this sketch box thing? Wow. <laughs> it's very light, guys. I think if you, if you try talking on the black side and close to your mouth, uh, I think, can people hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the temper, I mean, how temperature changes. So at the level of the of the mathematical model, you can study how it changes depending on the graph, for instance. How it changes depending on the interaction. So here I took the nearest neighbor model. These are complicated questions, but more importantly, they are not that important question at the level of the mathematical model for a reason which is connected to the question before that as a mathematician, you are mostly interested in properties that we call universal, properties that don't depend too much on the definition of your system. Why? Because I think you all agree that a magnet is not going to be made of dipoles that are exactly regular in space. In a, in, in a space. It's a much more complicated system. If the properties you prove are extremely dependent on the actual parameter, it's terrible. That means that it's not interesting. So you are not interested in the, in particular, the critical temperature depends very much on the discretization, on how you define your model. So this is not a property that we are so much interested in. We are much more interested in these emergent flows that are universal. So I don't think it has been so much of a subject to try to understand very delicately how the critical parameter varies simply because it's not a universal property. There's somebody just after you. That's simpler to yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this this is basically what Peirce did. And uh, so in 1936, so this is a much simpler question. So it's, you, you prove indeed first that it exists, then it's kind of defined implicitly in some sense, it's a place where there is a change between zero spontaneous magnetization and strictly positive spontaneous magnetization. And then you start studying whether it's a continuous fraction or not. But indeed, you first need to prove that there is a, a phase transition, by the way, Proving that in very general setting is something that we only managed to do a few years ago. Right. So, so it's a difficult question in general, but not for the here. Uh, so as soon as you look at an infinite system you don't really have a topology behind it what you can do is you can instead take a, a surface for instance so you think of the torus and try to make a finer and finer mesh size lattice instead of looking at lattice where edges are of length one you can take length delta and take the limit you get the same critical point, you get the same continuity in some sense, all of this is connected. It's only the emergent loads, what you get after, which start differing and vary depending on the topology and, and, and kind of encodes the topology of the surface in which you are. So for the matter of this talk, it doesn't change anything. What you can do in this, in terms of topology, you could go to higher dimension. 
And actually, the thing works in any dimension larger than three. So you can do four dimension, five dimension, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, you can wonder, OK, why a mathematician would try to work in four dimensions, say? But for instance, the four dimensional reasoning model is related through quantum physics to our actual world. Remember that we were, we, we actually live in a four dimensional world, right? At least, well, I should be careful that there is some string theory around. Uh, you don't always be careful. Uh, but so there is three space and one time dimension, right? So the four dimensional reasoning model is also very interesting to study. So you can look at this at least at this level, you are interested in the dimension already. But if you look at image and close them, you can start playing with the stuff. I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, hey. That's really impressive. Close to three miles. Oh. It's not uh, COVID friendly, right? <laughs> oh, oh well, gosh, <laughs> that would be cut. Uh, yes. Okay, so is there still a connection? Is, is the connection surviving in some sense? The fact, I mean, is it dependent on the fact that it's the nearest neighbor model or does it extend to any graph? It extends to any graph, the connection. It's actually not mattering what graph you are on, there is always this connection. This kind of graphical encoding of the correlation of the system works on any graph. You can take the ZZIG model is also interesting. You see, it's a model for cooperative phenomena in some sense. You want to align with the people that you are interacting with. So it's also something good for social media or things like that. So you can look at much more weird graphs and much less regular graphs. The connection to percolation is still there. It will always be. Uh, my, uh, you are the chief, so. and you can ask. <laughs> um, so, looking at this, uh, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. I've seen the Ising model in my lectures, um, and this is a really cool way of looking at it. Um, but you took a very uh, mathematical approach from a more mathematical background. Yeah. Um, for the physicists in the room who are also thinking like me, wow, that's really interesting. Um, how can I um, study this with my background uh, and get more in like what kind of route would you recommend? Uh, I always recommend it to learn math. But, <laughs> 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 but uh, no, no, but I mean, so where, I mean, the question is where could, uh, could we see a presentation that doesn't focus on the mathematical rigorous aspect of it but more yeah, on the, what's a good way to yeah. get into the topic from a so perspective? so in general i think i mean if, from the physical uh, side i would actually recommend not to stick to the easing model so this thing that some statistical physics models are connected to some percolation model is much more general than just easing and they are in particular this graphical representation for instance for what we call pots model which are kind of random coloring and easing model is just one specific case and there, uh, so it's called the fourth thing of interpolation, it's actually what is in the middle here. And there, there are some very cool connections when you try to sample, the, look at dynamics on, on random coloring and things like that, where there maybe you don't care so much about the rigor. So maybe looking at this graphical representation in general, in particular in the context of dynamics and way to sample your model, because it gives you very, very, very efficient ways of sampling your model. How do you sample a random object. It's not so so trivial to do. Actually. You need to be smart because your machine has only finite amount of energy and so on. So there are some very concrete application of this percolation representation to the sampling of 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 raising model in particular. So it's called Swenson and Wong, for instance, uh, uh, dynamics, and they are very useful in general in physics. So I would actually recommend to look at it through this rather than diving directly to, I mean, I mean, you see this connection is actually interesting to cool things. So in some sense, you know, maybe not the first thing to look at as a physicist. So this dynamics is going to be a better way to have it. Yeah. Thank you. And it's going to be based on this connection. Yeah. And then, uh, okay. uh, I think, <laughs> I think we you can ask the question after I don't disappear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Um, if you want to sign up to the Business Society, you can do it outside. Uh, and if you feel that's a very personal person, uh, not too personal. Not too personal. Thank you so much. That was, I was, I really, 